Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to another episode From of the Saigon. Nope. What? Never mind. Vietnam War good, reference. Good, Vietnam War reference. Good morning, Vietnam. Movie reference? Okay. Uh, this is an episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Yes. My name is Jason Camisa. That is Derek hyphen Miserable Scott. <laughs> the, the, the Tam part out? The Tam part's not miserable. Tam hyphen Miserable Scott. Uh, Tam Miserable hyphen Scott? Part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. Um, today we're going to talk about things that are dirty words in the automotive industry. One especially. Are we going to disclose it at this point? I can't, I can't say it. It's a... <laughs> hey, listen, there was that that hybrid Cadillac that uh, did the drag race thing and then just did like really well at Le Mans or something. Not mm. all hybrids suck. Some blow. Mm. We will talk about both. Both, both types of hybrids, um, as well as other things like... Tracking, long haul trucking? Long haul trucking. Track... Tracking front wheel drive Volkswagen electric shitbox hatchbacks and um, and more. Don't forget that if you like this uh, type of content, <laughs> you should probably go somewhere else. But if you like this particular <laughs> you should content, get your head looked at. You could probably, yeah, you probably should. Uh, you might consider joining the Haggerty Drivers Club, which includes unlimited tows for all of your flatbed vehicles, a subscription to our award win award winning magazine, unlimited access to evaluation tools, VIP events, and other such stuff. There is a Discounts link below. Discounts on Griot's Garage. That's I learned true. recently. Uh, and you? a bunch of other products. Well, I, w I was reading my HDC email. Is there a real? Is is it a problem if I like huff the that interior cleaner because it smells so good? The leather leather stuff? No, it's the the clear oh, interior really? I didn't treatment know that stuff cleaner. Had a smell. It's very mild, and I really enjoy it. And <laughs> I occasionally lock myself in the car and hotbox it with <laughs> with, with heavily cleaner. discounted Griot's Garage uh, formulate uh, formula. Anyway. Also, channel 1194, Samsung TV. If you have a TV that says Samsung, you can watch all of our stupidity on channel 11. I wish it was 1134. Because if you remember correctly, as a fetus, you could type 0.1134 on your calculator, turn it upside down, and it would say, hello. Or I was hell. don't remember this, but I had... Um the Texas Instruments TI-83, and those things had, like, games on them, so yeah, we didn't we, have to, like, it had a display with pixels. Did you ever snake. know that you are my rat bastard? <laughs> anyway. Well, um, on to the episode after I uh, attempt to clap, and then you have a jingle. I have to jingle? <laughs> yes, you have to jingle. Now. No, it didn't work. Is the no. jingle broken? Yeah, something something happened. It's a Lucas jingle. Jake. Jake. <laughs> Jake, where are you? Okay, welcome back. Or not. To the Carmudgeon show. Oh. Still? Still? Again. Again. Uh, also. Also. Um, okay, so we are going to talk about, we're going to use a dirty word. In fact, it's such a dirty word that in that drag race Is it going to be bleeped out? No, I, we added a burp sound effect when I said, hybrid, and we put a burp underneath it, mm -hmm. um, because it's a dirty word. Because well, you say hybrid, I think Prius. This is uh, going to be, it already is one of our most obscene episodes ever, potty mouth. Because... <laughs> Listen, because you've I, already said. That. I think all of the curse words need to have a certain amount of points associated with it, and hybrid is a dirty word, but it's like zero point zero three on oh, the is it? hybrid scale. Yeah, it's other things I've said because it's not a four letter word. I can think of some some ten pointers that are not uh, dirty words. Um, however, um, before we get started, I'd like to talk about a non sponsor of this episode because uh, this episode is not sponsored by anyone. However, a friend of mine, except for Haggerty Drivers Club and Samsung TV, it, they are not sponsors. That presented ha by pre that that's our patron. Haggerty is who we work for. Mm. Um, so this is part of this is a 
part of the Haggerty podcast. Anyway, a friend of mine started a coffee company. Yes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You don't drink coffee, so this is... Rudy Giuliani also started a coffee company. He did? Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) Notice I'm not going to talk about that. Um, Please don't. However, this friend of mine, she doesn't like to put any chemicals in her body. And she's like, she found out that coffee is sprayed with like pesticides and all kinds of other shit. And that didn't... Sounds like some California stuff. Um, She doesn't live in California. And is not from California. But she's a health nut. Uh-huh. I don't know why she's friends with me because I'm not. Um, except that Speaking ever which, since thank she you for the donuts, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> and ever since she moved away, I have gotten fatter because I used to hike a lot with her, and now I don't anymore. Um, but anyway, she started a coffee company, and um, more importantly, though, set this up so it is a hold on sustainably farmed, shade grown, pesticide free organic coffee that is small batch craft roasted. Okay, whatever. Uh, however, the, more importantly, she decided to give back. To the community and a portion of the sales go to uh, a charity called Loyal to My Soil, which is founded by a retired Major League Baseball player. I don't know who or what that is, but apparently that's a thing. Type um, of sports ball. It's probably a sports, car, uh, sports ball, but they provide <laughs> free baseball camps and instruction to kids in underserved communities. And I thought that was pretty cool. So um, even though we don't play sports ball, you don't drink and coffee. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> um, uh, you can go to pickmebean.com um, and get coffee, which is different than flickmybean.com. And she's going to kill me when she hears me say that um, <laughs> because I have to make fun of her. However, pickmebean.com, if you'd like to, if that charity and or sports ball, the idea is, you know, teaching kids how to play baseball and giving them free baseball camp. And I think that's pretty cool. So I mentioned, mentioned yeah. it. It's okay. Back to place to be than running around on the street. Yeah. Dreaming of one day owning a Subaru. <laughs> okay, now you've said another dirty word. Uh, Subaru and hybrid and the Subaru hybrid, which is now a thing. Oh, God. <laughs> misery on top of misery. Uh, we better stop before Tying two rocks together to see if they'll float. So you and I did a... <laughs> God. I'm trying to move away from this. Okay. You and I had a fun experience. We went to Sonoma Raceway and uh, for an event mm-hmm. and we both showed up in gray Volkswagen golfs Mm -hmm. what does that say about us and our friendship i often do show up in a gray volkswagen golf so do you yeah it's contagious i know but we went to a race (laughs) that what it says about our friendship is that we are cycling would help um no it's i mean with the fact that we both went to sonoma raceway and and we're told there would be free track time and we chose front wheel drive golfs I mean, I have this four thousand dollar plus uh, an espresso machine track car, which I have never taken on track yet. That so, was your first time ever on track with that car, yeah? No shit, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that was my first time ever on track in both of our cars. I, yes, your GTI um, is very fast and very capable and very easy to drive. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean it needs a rear sway bar. Yes. Uh, big. And some negative camber yeah. maybe in the front. Um, I went It's very safe. I went back and watched uh, the in-car footage from the video of us in my gray Volkswagen hatchback. Mm-hmm. And I believe the quote was, I wish my track car handled like this. Look at that rear end. Even yeah, under I wish throttle. my GTI would do this. This car is so much more neutral than mine. Then your race car? Yeah. Carousel. Yes. That's my favorite turn on this track. Okay. How beautifully oh. neutral that was. Holy shit. Oh no, we're being out horse powered. We'll catch him in the corners in another car somewhere some other day. Well, this thing's limited to 85 yeah, anyway. We just hit the limiter. So. <laughs> it's yes. more neutral than my track car. It's more ne- neutral than Beatrice's. Well, Beatrice has no sway bar right now. Yeah, this thing is now quite good chassis wise. ABS, hold on. Well, yes, my car won't rotate no matter what. Uh, Your car, however, is happy to <laughs> rotate. My car would not rotate. Okay. So yes, it was the e-golf, which was the stupidest thing I could have done. But I, I, when we were told free track time, we didn't, I don't think I was going to have more than an hour. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to torture myself in something else. I'll bring the e-golf and do one lap. 
um, which it surprisingly can't do, <laughs> do without overheating yes. uh, because it doesn't have any battery cooling ability whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't turn off, but it just... No, it just was stuck. severely limited. Um, the first half of a lap was great. Uh, the second half of the lap... If you take the car on twisty back roads on the street, will it also decompensate at all? Never. I've really? never had a cup power. Even if you like run it all the way up to Mount Tam? I ran it to the top of Tam in the middle of the night on a bet with our friend who worked for Tesla who did battery cooling stuff for Tesla. And he's like, that thing wouldn't even make it up Mount Tamalpais in like, you know, normal conditions. So I went at night uh, on a warm summer night and I bombed up the entire mountain as fast as I could and... I mean, the temperature, there's like a little power output gauge, mm-hmm. um, wasn't pegged the whole time, but it was like, you know, the, pegged a, meaning at maximum ability to deliver maximum power. ability. Right. Yes. And then there is an actual current output gauge. And I think the lowest I saw was like 95 out of hundred. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, no, it doesn't really care on track, the street. Oh yeah. Track use different story. Yes. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that I drove, uh, first the, the, the one we videoed, um, was with full regen on Mm -hmm. um the car was undrivable i got very sideways three or four times in in because it would just periodically stand on the brakes effectively dynamically speaking through regen i think it's driver error but i just it would have taken me a while to learn how to manage the transition from power to regen Mm -hmm. and i didn't uh so i went out i went back out afterwards and did a lap fast lap without it in one pedal driving mode effectively Mm -hmm. um and i will say it is the best handling front wheel drive car i've ever driven on a racetrack Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. for the first three corners until it no longer has enough power to pull itself through yes um you need to call zero three from motorsport and get a big huge enormous like tree trunk size rear sway bar on your race car yeah because my electric shit box is handles better than your race car but but it has a zero three four rear sway bar on it to be clear yes uh, and pilot well it had pilot sport for s's now it has bald <laughs> pilot sport for s's now um, you can't read what brand they are because you've been driving on the sidewalls no michelin if you're listening <laughs> um, um anyways yes. so that was not the primary purpose of our visit no we were there but for- together they do form a hybrid system one is gas and the other is electric <laughs> yeah the two golfs together yes, yes. <laughs> uh the two idiots together. oh and then they of course they talked me into doing the wet skid pad mm-hmm. in the golf and i'm like why would i do that and they're like the bar in the back uh yeah predictably it rotates when you come off the gas and then falls into understeer when you're on the, on the mm-hmm. accelerator very difficult to sustain a drift in a front yeah. wheel drive car they're, no matter how large the rear bar is yeah you can initiate them yes uh, but, but sustain uh, no yeah Free wheel drive for the win. But we were there for another hybrid thing, which is um, really, really, really cool. Yes. I was actually really fascinated by the whole experience. Great. I'm just going to sit here and drink. Um, If you can explain to the audience what we did. Okay. So the reason why this involved free track time is because the founder of this company is a dyed-in-the-wool petrol head. uh, Possessing, uh, let's see... Where do you want to start? An S14 engine BMW 2002. Yes, with all like bespoke suspension. I met him when he worked for Tesla, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was there to get a look at the prototype Model X. Um, which he then sat me in and drifted through. This is a car literally minutes away from being put on a truck to be brought to the New York Auto Show. And he just rolled up the roll up and drifted the car sideways through the opening and then drifted it around the track. And then we had to clean it up really quickly before it went in the truck. <laughs> so he's not only died in the wool petrol head, he's fucking nuts. Yes. Um, in, in like the... In the petrol head sense. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so his name is Ali Javedan. Mm-hmm. Javedan. And he started this company... Range Energy, Range Energy. Uh, to solve a very specific problem in a very realistic way. Because, uh, of course, we know that it's a long-haul trucking is the solution. How's that for an exciting car mudgeon, truck mudgeon subject? Uh, however, when you experience the product, I think it's it's an interesting reflection also of what happens in the automotive world. This is kind of the Toyota practical way, which is the hybrid way, as opposed to going full EV, which would be like the Tesla semi way. Yeah. I think we need to talk about the new 992.2 Porsche 911 GTS, which mm. is a hybrid done in a very different way. So maybe this will become the hybrid episode. Um, but 
Well, what, the, the intro we gave should probably also be a signpost for that. So no one listens to that shit. Um, they have to. <laughs> they can skip. Um, no. So in, in the trucking world, very much like in the enthusiast community, there is a very much electric versus gas. Fuck you. No, fuck you. No, fuck you. Um, no one. You're, you're in one camp or the other. And never the two well, shall meet. It's also worth pointing out that I think that in the trucking world, the argument against EVs is stronger than in the car world because the fundamental question you must ask a car owner is what percentage of the days that you are driving do you cover more than, choose range of EV, 300, 400 right. miles. Right. If you ask that question of a long haul trucker, they will be like, all Every of day. Yeah. And Every so day. they'll be like, this is dumb and this yeah. is why you shouldn't have fully electric. I mean, unless you're doing last mile deliveries or something like, but that's what not what long haul trucking right. is. Yeah. So this solution, I think, makes particular sense, is, which is to do a hybrid solution. And I think the maximum cleverness, let's just describe mm. the product right. first, which is that it is exclusively a trailer. The tractor that pulls it is a completely unremarkable anything that you want. You could use anything really to pull it. Right. And these are the things that are owned by the truck drivers, right? So when you see a tractor trailer on uh, on the road, somebody owns that tractor, which is the, the motor and the sleeping cab and all of the, the things that pull the heavy shit. The heavy shit, that's owned by whoever, either a trucking company or Walmart or whoever owns that. And so you hook up those trailers to your tractor and you drive around and you put a couple million miles on this straight six diesel and everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. And the argument about the argument, one of the biggest arguments against electrifying the fleet from the perspective of the owners of these tractors is here I have a diesel engine that's got three more million miles left in it. Why should I throw it out in favor of an electric something that isn't as good because it's not going to be able to haul all day long. Right. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable, um, reasonable complaint. And so Ali and company came up with the idea of not of leaving them fully alone and attacking the trailer, mm -hmm. just the trailer. Um, so there's three major components to the trailer that differentiate it. You have a smart kingpin mm -hmm. and I, got to try this out on a like sort of car hauler size trailer and what it does it basically detects forces mm -hmm. uh, and then it just multiply or it, it then interprets that into a signal which it then passes along to the e axle which is the two axles in the back which have motor on them i guess probably one i assume i actually don't know the number of motors back there i think it was two uh, okay, so anyway, the, there's a motor or motors at the back, and then there is a battery pack, effectively. But to be very clear, these are entirely conventional trailers that can yes. be hooked up to any tractor yes. without any electrical connection yeah, at all. Nothing other to plug lighting, in, right? So yes. nothing different than Beyond, any other. Different from a regular trailer. Yeah. And so all of it is done through the kingpin, which detects forces, and then it just interprets those forces into into instructions for the motors. Right, and kingpin being the the truck term for your trailer ball. So everything, it's as usual, the, flows yes. through the forces on your balls. As the universal truth of <laughs> motoring and yeah. not motoring. Um, and so the idea is if, if the only thing connecting the tractor and the trailer is this kingpin, and if you can measure the force on it and make use, use an electric motor that's on the trailer to make sure that that force is always zero, you can effectively make that trailer weightless. Yes, if, Which if, is, I don't know if they go for full zero or if it's just assist. Well, In the experience gonna, that I did where I was pulling on a car hauler, mm -hmm. the force was almost zero. You could do it with one finger, right. basically. When you enable it, you can move a full-size trailer with a thing on it, a, you know, with a car and waste a couple thousand pounds with your finger, mm -hmm. not even your arm. Like, I was over-controlling it initially because I, I'm used to pulling trailers around using, you know, you have to put m much of your of body it, right? weight into it. But I was over controlling it because I was calibrated to that. But you can move it around with one finger, basically. Yeah, there that sensor is so unbelievably sensitive that just with two fingers on it, you can you can force this thing. Not force, you're not forcing at all. It's, you can compel this trailer to yes. move around a warehouse as if it's completely weightless. Yeah. Um, and so in theory, you could put a car carrier on the back of a very small car mm -hmm. and the only problem that you'd ever have would be a side loading from a wind or something but you know you're taking as there long as the battery weight. and motors right as well yeah but you, you can adjust that properly but the the whole idea is you can effectively make whatever you're towing weightless yes um in the world of trucking though which is the first real commercial application of this um what you're doing is 
giving turning a conventional powertrain into a range uh, a, a plug-in hybrid mm-hmm. effectively yes. um and so they're seeing 40 to 50 percent or was it 45 to 50 i think it was 35 35 to, to 40 percent less uh fuel consumption, fuel consumption. Right. And so what they're doing is they're looking at two ways. Number one, if you start out with a fully charged battery um, in the, on the trailer um, for over the course of a 300 mile run, um, you can see 35 to 45% fuel economy benefit. And that's because it's performing regen. You think rather than you ever hitting the brakes, it will regen in the back um, and store that energy back into the uh, battery, which you can then redeploy again. This is how hybrids work. Um, But once that battery is, uh, is depleted. P- depleted. It will go into a mild hybrid mode, um, and e- even then, you're looking at five. Definition to 10. time of mild hybrid. Definition time for mild hybrid. You're not using mains power. You're just only recovering what you've what you've you're able to regen. Yeah. So the, basically, the way that the only recharging of the battery that's happening in that circumstance is recovering kinetic energy. Right. And even in the deceleration, even in the sort of truck route where they're mostly highway, you can still see a five to 10% range increase or efficiency increase, which is amazing, right? To just say, well, if you're going to pull this trailer anyway, you might as well electrify the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You attach it like a normal one and see for 300 miles at a time, a huge increase in efficiency. Um, And then it's sort of in perpetuity of five to 10% fuel savings, which would be far greater in stop and go traffic, for example, or Mm -hmm. hilly terrain. Yes. So we got a demonstration. We got to ride in a semi, which was a new and fun experience Mm -hmm. for me. Uh, And we, it was loaded with 20,000 pounds, the trailer, and we got a demonstration of it both on and off. And fortunately the terrain around Sonoma is very steep. And so we got a very interesting demonstration of, how that functioned. Yeah, it was. it's interesting. We'll, we have video of it, so we'll play that. Like I said, 20,000 pounds, very steep incline. We'll uh, try to get going. <laughs> you gotta get dual clutches in these things. Right? So you feel how it's like, it, it's getting going, but it's not comfortable doing it. Like it's, yeah. it's dragging back a lot. Uh, but the interesting thing is that, uh, oh, I don't remember how many gears it had. It was like 12, 12 or 18 gears. I think it was less. Um, some enormous number of gears, mm-hmm. more than more than a six-speed. Um, and the first couple of them are really, really short. And closely stacked. Though, yeah, and those diesels have very l- small operating windows. I yeah, the red, red line, line is like... 2200 rpm or something like that and so you're idling at 500 you really only you have a very small window of acceleration before you have to shift again and then they're single clutch automated manuals and so starting this poor thing on a on a 20,000 pound trailer on a big hill was um i felt bad for it Yes. I don't have all that much mechanical sympathy, but you know, like the, the driver just puts his foot on the floor and the clutch sort of figures it out and you start moving and you get to, I don't know, five or six miles an hour. And then it has to shift, loses half of the speed that it had already attained during the shift and then barely inches its way back to like 10 miles an hour. At which point that happens again. Um, and then that was with the, the hybrid system or the the assist on the trailer completely off, just yeah. to give you a baseline of what it's normally like. I mean, we're starting on I don't know an eight percent grade or something like that, which is quite steep for mm-hmm. a semi, especially with some load on it. And then uh, <clears throat> what? So the the trailer has a three what is it three hundred and thirty five horsepower or something like that? Uh, it is th- uh, three thirty five peak two sixty eight sustained horsepower. Horsepower. So basically, and, and those tractors depending on what they are they don't have that much horsepower they have a shitload of torque but not that much horsepower like you might expect 400 horsepower mm-hmm. from one of those things so adding another two or three hundred horsepower is very substantial yeah. especially when you account for how much torque is it for uh they didn't actually didn't say uh the specs didn't say how much torque it was okay um but it's going to be a lot right these right. are not high speed motors so but the difference was you know, this, I think the, the truck maxed out at like 13 or 14 miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, matted, matted, he, it would not accelerate beyond, you know, I thought it was like 15 miles an hour or something like that, uh, going up this gradient. Right. Like it just could not accelerate any farther. 
And then he switched he switched on the electrical assist, and it was actually hilarious because the first thing you hear is the turbo spooling. Yeah. Um, so it was sitting in that spot in whatever gear it was in where it was just, you know, probably Fourth. able to get mi minimal amount of boost. And all of a sudden, we just take off in the turbo and flew up the hill like it was nothing. Yeah. I mean, it accelerated right to 35, 40 miles an hour up this hill as if it was not a hill. So yeah, my foot's on the floor. Really, truck's struggling. <laughs> it's just like, a, like an extra turbo right? or three and holy hell like, <laughs> um pretty cool stuff yeah um, it was very illuminating because there's not that many situations in the real world especially as drivers of cars where we really you sometimes get in it if you drive an old car that's not very powerful or any car that's not very powerful and you're going up a hill sometimes you'd be like well fifth gear is not going to work here we gotta go to four oh we gotta go to third yeah. Yeah. and uh if you have driven cars like this you know this experience which is very trucking is like this to the extreme and yeah. so it was really interesting to be in one of those situations where you're matted in third gear and maintaining speed and capable of no more uh, and then all of a sudden to just sort of blast off like that. Well, just to know that everyone behind you fucking hates you. Mm -hmm. Also to know that what goes up must come down. I mean, at some point, you know, whatever energy you've expended going up that hill, you're going to be able to recuperate a bunch on the way back down. Yes, as to opposed to again. using one of those runaway truck ramps. Right. And that's the other thing is uh, when they were, Ali told me when they were testing, they were able to uh, make it the entire way down the grapevine, which is a 4,000, well, you peaks at what, 4110 or something feet mm -hmm. at the top. This is on I-5 between San Francisco entering LA. Um, you have this huge climb. It's a 4,000 foot peak. I think you start at, our, you've climbed gradually to about 1,000. And then from 1,000 to 4,000 is a really steep climb, mm -hmm. um, which is fun in a car, especially a fast car. I mean, there's signs if all over. Has turn off. cooling. Yeah, turn off AC, big hill ahead, which is, you know, it's always like 100 degrees there. And I'm yeah. like, oh, watch this. I have a German car to manage. Um, but going down the other side, you're always seeing trucks with that are doing 60 miles an hour and they're supposed to be doing like 35 or 40, whatever the speed limit mm -hmm. is with smoke billowing out of their brakes mm -hmm. going, all right, if anything happens, this truck has no ability to stop at all. The brakes mm -hmm. are already overheated, just trying to get the thing to not, um, to not run away. Yeah. Um, and they made it to the bottom of the grapevine having never touched the brake pedal at all at the speed limit. And that's a game changer because if every trailer had this sort of braking ability, um, mm -hmm. Okay, and energy recovery. And energy recovery, you we could get rid of all the runaway truck ramps effectively. Mm -hmm. Right. Until there's a mechanical glitch or you know, or the battery's full and it just can't do anything with that yes. energy. Um, but a really cool solution that says, all right, the current diesel trucks have a, a, a long life left and in a lot of ways make a lot more sense than right. And then EVs. it shifts the investment also away from the owner operator of the tractor onto the fleet owner of the trailers right. instead, which will be more tend to be more corporate entities who can think in and I assume they pay for fuel. I don't know who pays for the fuel. Gosh, we are exposing our ignorance on the subject matter. Yeah. I mean, that was the first time I've ever was in a tractor trailer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But I, one has to assume the trucking. This is why we are the car mudgeon show. Not, Not the truck, truck mudgeon yeah. show. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, really, really cool technology. And I love that. Like, you know, here we, we come to Sonoma Raceway to see this technology and the cars in the parking lot. <laughs> like, I am... So disappointed that the world hate EV world hates gas cars and gas car people hate EV world because these are the same people. We're all the same guys, you know. Ali worked for Tesla, helped make some amazing stuff happen there. Then he went to Zooks, whatever. But he's got an S14 motored. 2002. He's got yeah, a, and a, a, a Ford. British Ford Escort with a uh, I don't know even what it is. It's a twin cam turbocharged four Monster. cylinder thing that with a sequential gearbox in it and. True car guys. Dry yes. his, his daily is a 911. I mean, he, uh, you know, and the parking lot's filled with, Lucid was there, obviously. <gasps> you got to drive a Lucid. I did, yes. I drove the Sapphire. It's the first Lucid product I've driven, and I was a Sapphire on track. Of course, go right <laughs> for the for the gold. Um, I mean, it was just, I was hopelessly over my in over my head in that thing. I mean, I've never drive anything on track with more than 250 horsepower. <laughs> so to so that had a thousand with, more than your previous record. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just... It was so overwhelming. Yeah. That's too much car. That. Fair point. Um, I, yeah. I mean, uh, immensely impressive. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I stand by my, it's the best handling car in the yeah, world. Yeah. The, the, 
the it's also very friendly. I think that's the other thing to note is that you know the generally twelve hundred horsepower cars are not super easy to drive, but it was very easy and flattering, and it does exactly what you want it to. It executes your requests in a very faithful way, mm-hmm. which is shocking given that it weighs 5,000 pounds because it really doesn't behave like it weighs 5,300 yeah. pounds or whatever no. it weighs. No, plus that, I mean, how many people were in the car when you drove it? I think just, we were two. Just two? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right, but back to hybrids. Mm-hmm. So this week, uh, so what, this will have been a couple of weeks ago by the time you guys hear this, uh, the new Bugatti is being announced. That is a hybrid. Um, we're sort of seeing a resurgence of hybrids, and there have been several- Resurgence. They never really went away. They didn't, but I think we're seeing it in performance. So we had 918, right? 918 Spider yes. was one of the few sort of real over-the-top performance hybrid cars that I've, that I've driven. Um, and man, was it fast and good and flat plane, cranky and amazing. Um, but Porsche, the 992.2 GTS, really, I think, has changed the way um, we're all going to feel about hybrids. Um and that's all I have to say on the matter. <laughs> Is that all you have to say on the matter? No, absolutely not. Okay, so that's what I thought. Um, so I, nothing makes me happier than uh, hearing journalists say this car has no turbo lag. And I've said it. I said it when the nine nine one. Nothing makes you happier. Two came. Doesn't that make steam come out of your ears? No, because it means that I know who it's. I know immediately whom to ignore forever. There is no such thing as a turbocharged engine without lag. You can. You can fix it with other technologies, or you can say it doesn't feel like it has lag, or the everything is programmed in such a way that the lag isn't intrusive, but there will be turbo lag. And 991.2, when Porsche went from naturally aspirated straight, uh, flat sixes to turbo flat sixes, that was one of the best down, that was downsizing done right. So mm-hmm. they, you know, they went from 3.6 and 3.8 liters to, to 3.0. Twin turbo, they were responsive. Uh, but I remember when I made that um, when I made that video. This was back in the Motor Trend days. Um, I actually plotted out the engine's response at different RPMs, and that's very difficult to do on the road. You, you sort of need really need a dyno to do that. But what I did was I put a V box in in that 911, and at 500, I think it was 500 RPM increments. God, this is 10 years ago already. Um, 500 RPM in- increments. I would floor it and hit a trigger, and I would then watch the acceleration curve uh, and see where it sort of peaked and then became the maximum available at that speed in that gear. So you do one run where you sort of brake torque, get full boost from 1,000 RPM to redline in that gear. And so now I know on a chart exactly where the maximum acceleration is at every given speed. Mm -hmm. And then I did at 500 RPM increments, zero throttle at all, mat it, um, and then watch how long it takes from the second I uh, my foot triggered triggered the countdown until it hit that original curve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that in an M2, a 9.11, and also a naturally aspirated car. I think it was my Scirocco, just because that's what I had there. And the difference in response time was like in, unbelievable. It went from, I think the Scirocco was somewhere around 0.15 to 0.25 of a second, sort of throughout the rev range. And at the very top of the rev range, that Porsche was double that. So half second, which is, Totally fine Total to go from no boost to full boost. Um, but down low, you're still looking at multiple seconds. Um, and so Porsche, this new engine that they've come out with, um, they've said that if you start at 2000 RPM uh, in the previous GTS, mm-hmm. um, if you applied full throttle, it would take more than three seconds to get to full boost. And the new one is less than one. Mm-hmm. And less than one second at 2,000 RPM is now approaching naturally aspirated. Naturally aspirated. I mean, it's not really, but it's close enough that you can start to really drive around it. And mm-hmm. you know, how many situations are you going to be in at 2,000 RPM in a higher gear? So you're in fourth gear at 2,000 RPM, and you mat it, and you need to move quickly. With a PDK, it's just going to downshift. And mm-hmm. so by the time it's pulled off its downshift, it'll be a full boost anyway. Um, but it's done this in a really, really, really clever way. Yes, so tool to two tools are being used to do this. Two tools? Well, you have the electric turbocharger mm-hmm. and you have the electric motor oh, inside yeah. of the transmission. To, to yeah. So they they've electrified this motor in two ways. First all right, so first things first they went from um, a 3.6 liter 
down to uh, three point no uh, other three way. point other way around three point oh liter up to a three point six liter, mm -hmm. which in the interest of fuel economy you would think is the wrong direction, but uh, mm -hmm. more on that anon. More on that later. Um, and it's the tur turbocharger count is halved, yes, so one to two one to one turbo, um, and, and the boost pressure actually went down slightly. The maximum boost went from one point four to one point three bars. Um, the net result of at the the engine alone makes five more horsepower, mm -hmm. which seems pretty pathetic going Again, going from three to three point six liters. However, however, having less boost, having less boost is a is an actual is a huge boon to emissions because mm -hmm. the higher the boost level, the more the chance that you're going to have to run rich, and running rich crucifies fuel economy and throws emissions through the through the roof. And this is because of the, uh, this is one of those laws you learn about in physics, but basically when you compress stuff, it gets hot and therefore you add more fuel to bring combustion temperatures down. I've never understand, I've never understood, to be honest, why fuel extra running rich cools everything down other than the cooling effect of the fuel itself atomizing. Yeah, I think um, it's actual vaporization. Yeah, that's the only... As we learned also at Sonoma Raceway uh, about, uh, we, exper we experienced or saw up close a Ford Model T mm. and uh, the steward of the car, who also is the owner, uh, but I, call, I don't know, steward seems like a more appropriate word. Um, he was telling us that on a warm day, like 70 degrees, you will get uh, carburetor icing, like frost forming on the outside of the carburetor. And this is just because of the energy... Uh, from the evaporation of the fuel, yeah, and so I think that it's probably the same effect, which is the just the vapor. God, it's uh, the so evaporation of vapors is actually right. It's the same reason why if I Vaporization spray you in the face fuel. with hairspray, you're going to say, "Oh, that's cold," uh, and that's neat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then but maybe your experience carcinogens. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, I think adding it is understood not by us that adding fuel uh, reduces combustion temperatures. Right. Uh, so and so, it's used often on on uh, on every as an engine protecting measure yeah. to um, prevent detonation. Every turbocharged car in the world will wind up running rich, if not immediately, um, within a couple in, seconds of running under full boost, yeah. um, because everything gets so hot that you have to run rich, which crucifies emissions, and that's a problem in a in a world where the European regulations are effectively ruling out combustion engines. They have to do all the tricks possible. So going to a larger displacement and a lower boost level allows Porsche to stay closer to stoichiometric more of the time, which means um, lower emissions and fuel uh, consumption for the same amount of power. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, uh, an electric motor sandwich between the engine and the PDK. Wait, let's talk about the turbocharger because that's well, the... I was going to... You're going to do the opposite order? I was going to do the opposite order because the electric motor is super quick, right? It's okay. just it's just a sandwich motor. It's sixty rated 64 horsepower um, peak for 10 seconds and then 54 continuous. But I think 110, yeah, 110 pound-feet of torque. That's a conventional thing. By the way, the reason when, when 991 came out, the reason for the engine layout change back in the, this is now 10 years ago, um, was to make room for a sandwich motor that they didn't use. Um, now they're finally using that place. So the motor, everything moves around slightly enough to get uh, an electric motor sandwich in there, that's standard fare. And then the turbo is electric, and that yes. is something we've not seen before in the US market. Is that so? I, I don't pay attention yeah. to new cars. Uh, there were, there have been sort of electric turbochargers where they're, they're either spooled, they're electric superchargers. Yes. Okay. This um, is, but that's like a different. Audi maybe does this, right. or Volvo, or Audi does it in Mercedes. Europe. Um, uh, Mercedes does it on the straight six engines. This is Both the fifty three engines. The fifty three and forty three. Forty three doesn't have the electric compressor, but yes. Um, so the Mercedes engine uses a electric supercharger, which is just a, a compressor, basically to throw extra air in. And it's using that to step in while the turbo is spooling, where Porsche is using a motor inside the turbo to just spool the turbo. So it's never, it's not, its primary mission is to get the turbo to its operating speed as quickly as possible. But it also possible. has exhaust gas recovery in addition yeah. to that. So that's the other benefit of it is you're never going to have a compressor. You can't have a compressor running in reverse to, mm -hmm. to regen. Um, so this turbocharger can either use power and it can use 20 kilowatts of roughly 30 horsepower to spin that turbo as quickly as possible was a 26 horse yes. 20, something like that 26.8 um, <laughs> jake would you throw something at him please um <laughs> 
fine. It can use roughly 26.803, uh, whatever, roughly more than 25 horsepower just to spin that turbo up as quickly as it possibly can, but then can also use the turbo, uh, the exhaust gas spinning that turbine uh, to create energy. And I think it's rated as 11 kilowatts, um, which is a huge amount of power, 11,000 watts. Um, I, AKA what 14.1 horsepower you do that math in your head um, and of course what putting an electric motor on that eliminates the, the any risk of the turbo overspeeding mm -hmm. which is one of the big problems right so Ferrari a couple years ago started to put a speed sensor in the turbine so that it could get to as close to the the turbines maximum possible speed previously it was estimated based on boost pressure and load and everything else but if you can get it closer to that you're you're you can make more power well in the case of this electric turbo you have an, a, an instantaneous and very precise measurement of how quickly the turbo is spinning um, and you can just add load mm. to slow it back down so it eliminates the needs for some of the wastegate and stuff and you're charging your battery that you can then apply that energy again later in the turbo or in the hybrid and yeah so in more. this in the case of this car at top speed um it'll actually it's using so full load which is probably close to redline in top gear or sixth gear or whatever it's eight speed D pdk now so probably in seventh gear knowing porsche um you're you're using the generator i gen, using the turbo as a generator to slow the speed of the turbo down generating electricity and feeding that electricity back into the sandwich, sandwich motor, motor which is this and that's how the car achieves loop. top speed yep even though it wouldn't be able to achieve that speed on just the internal combustion engine alone fucking unbelievable Mind blowing. Mind blowing. We also have not talked about it this in terms of response, right? That one of the huge benefits of the electric turbocharger is that you can use it to spool the turbo up much faster than waiting for exhaust gases to be passing by. That's that twenty five. So that's why power, yeah. Yeah, so that's why the the instead of taking three seconds to achieve full boost like it did with the old car, it's now under a second. Yep. And don't forget that you have the electric the electric sandwich motor, 110 pound feet of torque, that's also stepping in. So in your response from the outside of this crazy system that's that's balancing all this other stuff is an engine that probably actually responds, mm -hmm. a powertrain, I should say, power that, train, that yes. responds even more quickly than just a naturally aspirated engine would with ITBs and everything else. Yes, um, but not as quickly as an EV. Maybe. Remember, you have an EV. You have 54 horsepower, 64 horsepower worth of electricity to step in. Yeah, probably not as quick. <laughs> but probably. Hey, I mean, you want combustion? But yeah, if you want combustion, this is the way to right. do it. And this is why the topic is hybrid done right, because you get to experience uh, combustion joyfulness. Admittedly, PDK only. Uh, damn it, you beat me to it. <laughs> you beat me to it. I was going to say there's one enormous fucking problem with this. No manual. Can you put a sandwich motor in a manual transmission? There is one right outside because Jake has a Priata. Uh, Jake has a and a so Honda they Insight. used they used manual transmission componentry space for sandwich motor instead. Is that the deal, or did they specifically decide it could be done, or it couldn't be done, or I don't I don't think they want to do it. I mean, part of the, look in, in Europe, manual transmissions are dead mostly anyway because Europeans suck. Sorry, that's the way it is. Um, but it's very difficult to, I don't want to use the term cheat. Cheat is not right. The way the test procedures are written, it's very easy to optimize or to put in lines of make, code that optimize yeah. emissions and fuel economy testing for automatic when you don't have control over exactly what gear is being selected when and how you can't optimize for those tests. And so this is part of the reason why Porsches are geared so long because that's one of the tricks to reduce fuel, fuel consumption and they don't need to do those track uh, those tricks on the PDK cars. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I don't I doubt very much that the manual car would see enough of a benefit. Um or even be sort of possible. Or even be legal. Yeah, legal. Yeah, which sucks. Porsche has said there will be manual transmission 992s. And let's not forget the GT cars, which are the ones that we really love, but we really can't afford. Um, those are still available with manuals. Naturally mm -hmm. aspirated, four liter, 9,000 RPM. So I guess this is purely speculative or, or this question we cannot answer without doing any speculation is to what extent do both or one of these technologies end up in manual transmission cars? Like, is there a world in which the electric 
turbo makes it into a manual car, but not the sandwich motor or vice versa. I mean, they both can, both are possible, and it would be cool. There, and look, there's a weight penalty. Um, yeah, but the weight penalty was remarkable, like around 100, 100 pounds. pounds. Yeah, which is nuts. And the bat and the battery, by the way, weighs 60 of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, the none of this stuff. Okay, they're eliminating a, a whole turbo, you know, and all the plumbing for that. So that obviously saves weight. But yeah, 100 pounds is not. It's not nothing. But, you know, when you're talking about a 3,500 pound 911 anyway, what's 100 pounds? Yeah. Um, especially when you go from this, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't mean to say this about this car, particularly the laggy turbo, right? At the end of the day. A turbo po- a tur- possessing lag. Yeah. <laughs> it's not I a mean, laggy turbo. It was a really good turbocharged engine, but it mm-hmm. wasn't, there was no contest between a Carrera, any of the Carrera stuff, and a GT3. Um, For re- in gear responsiveness. In, in just personality right yes. when you don't have to work for the torque when you're not dependent on revs mm-hmm. it's just a very different experience um and to me what this does is make the 911 turbo completely irrelevant right because that car it, for a turbo is amazing but uh you know you drive a turbo 911 turbo s and a gt3 back to back and the gt3 is slow by comparison but if you want fast go buy something electric if you want an experience go buy something with a manual which you can't get a turbo s in or Mm -hmm. any of the turbos um and uh yeah yeah i agree that car is very pointless to me the the turbo has for many years been pointless to me i (laughs) it's also always been the not the one i wanted it's always to me been the least desirable of the entire 911 lineup fact checking fucking last fact checking I'm waiting. I think, uh, yeah, there is. I, my, I'm really. <laughs> Do fond you hear of the hard the, drive? Because the hard drive lights on. You just hear. <laughs> I'm really fond of the the last of the single turbo cars. I think that experience is. Uh, it's like driving a Supra with a big turbo. It's just like this hilarious experience. It's like driving my GTI. So you're not these, talking like, about a 930? No, I'm talking about the 964 3.6, the last rear-wheel drive single right. turbo car they made. I have not driven one. So enlighten us. Uh, I mean, it, it's a big turbo, so it, there's nothing down low, but it has five ratios that are much closer, so you get rid of the re- really awful... Like, if you ask me which part of the 930 experience offends me more, I think it's the gearing mm-hmm. and four ratios first, then the single turbo and the lag thing second, right? There's plenty of single turbocharged cars that you're like, okay, this is actually kind of charming. You know, uh, Audi RS2 or Renault Turbo 5, you know, there's a couple of single turbo cars. You're like, okay, I'm kind of into this, but it has to be a car where the gear ratios sort of make it so that there's some kind of mechanism to you have some proceed. hope right yeah <laughs> and the four some. speed 930 is so kneecapped that it just crosses over from like this is charming and turbocharged into like i would prefer to walk right now and push <laughs> this car into the bay uh and so i think the five speed single turbo cars being rear wheel drive mm. like would i choose it over other 911 like a, a rs38 or even an rs36 mm. no no i wouldn't would you choose it over a base 964 like two wheel drive, three point six liter <sighs> manual. No. So, like I said, the turbo is always the least desirable. QED. Here we are. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's right. And I, look, I, I can't say that because I, everyone knows I hate turbos. So, for me to say the turbo is the, the least desirable one, everyone will say, well, obviously, hardly a but headline. You, yeah, but for you, having driven them all, they're kind of always the least desirable. And the most expensive, which is of yeah, the and then after that, it becomes mandatory that you have four wheel drive, and then you really lose the plot. That's, I guess, the thing that I'm like, okay, it has a lot of turbo lag, and it's that old school like you might die kind of experience, and it has <laughs> gear ratios to actually like periodically use boost, uh, and you know the rear wheel driveness of it adds further like terror and risk, which is makes it more entertaining <laughs> than the than the four wheel drive yeah. turbos. Well, and more steering, much better steering. Feel. Yes, um, yeah, I. Uh, I, I will say I've driven a couple of GT2s that almost converted me to the Yeah, to the GT2 loving. is actually the spiritual successor to those five-speed single turbo yeah. 930, uh, tur- tur- 911 turbos yeah. of the 89 to 94 period. Yeah, the only, if I think about it, the only turbo cars that I, I 
really have ever liked have been cars that are so outspokenly turboed uh, that that becomes part of their charm. Yeah, and that um, single turbo thing really does that. Yeah, especially not. I mean, you go, you can get to like BMW, like an N fifty five is a single turbo. What is like that? A three thirty five or a three forty i. This so is F thirty. Uh, if you go to like E ninety, for example, the original, oh. the original one was an N fifty four, which was a twin turbo, and that was a fucking monster. And they then went to a single turbo car, uh, single turbo motor, the N fifty five when they replaced it, and it was is this almost, facelift E ninety or is this I, early F thirty? I did E ninety ever? No, I think it was F thirty. Um, either way, really three series, I don't remember exactly. I just remember driving them back to back and thinking, okay, the early twin turbo cars were faster. Um, mm -hmm. and I dynoed them to make sure that it wasn't just seat of the pants. Um, and the way the boost hit was a little bit differently, but those three forty eyes and three thirty five eyes were still monsters. I mean, they were just really quick to build boost for a turbo. And those are some of the, the few turbocharged cars that I've enjoyed, like a one M coupe. I would be happy with that sort of a level of turbocharged car, but it still is not as much of an experience as anything naturally aspirated. Sure. Um, but I just wonder if we're, if, you know, if what Porsche has just accomplished is now something we're going to see throughout the industry. Um, I mean, it certainly makes sense. I don't know how expensive it is. I mean, it could be that the system is so cost prohibitively expensive. We won't ever see it in a Miata or something, but I could see a system like this, Fixing the Miata's lack. Oh God, I don't want to say. I don't want to say it's got a lack of power. Miata's fast. Miata's like annoyingly fast. Yeah. Um, but so why bother? It, that adds weight and complexity. It's very counter yeah, to the ethos of the Miata. But it also adds. It also adds CO two numbers, mm -hmm. meaning subtracts CO two meaning it makes them cleaner because now they can run engine off. There's a bunch of other shit they can pull. Um, and that's why Porsche is doing it. Porsche is not doing this because, oh, we love complexity, even though we all know secretly know they do. But they're doing this to comply with fuel economy and emissions regulations and still make the cars faster. Yes, at the same time, it's the... Um the engineering compromise that everyone seeks, which is the no downsides yeah. except for weight and complexity, which um, is actually the, <laughs> that is yeah. very engineering compromise -y. Funny enough, Anthony Esposito just raced. He's got a GTI, Mark 7 GTI, and um, this is my right-hand man filming. Uh, Mark 7 GTI and an ND3 uh, Miata, ND2 Miata, um, and just raced them. And you know how fast the GTI is, right? The Miata was... Miata was quicker. To 90 to 90. 90. Yeah. And then the GTI flies by it. Uh, and I, I was, he was talking to me and he's like, I'm like, yeah, I know the GTI left it for dead. And he was like, no, no, that's the joke. The Miata pulled on the GTI at all speeds until now, if they did like an in gear pull at 3000 RPM at 60 miles an hour and whatever gear. Yes. Of course the GTI is going to be faster, but mm -hmm. just sort of rolling start, you know, 10 miles an hour in first gear, the Miata is quicker. And so I don't think the Miata needs a turbo, but the industry seems to think all the kids Neither say, does anyone else, especially after the uh, Mazda speed, speed Miata debacle. Well, but they're, I mean, they're saying next gen Miata might be hybrid and it may just have to be to pass emissions uh, in Europe. I would rather see it be hybrid in NA than, hmm, interesting. Well, so hybrid NA or hybrid plus an electric turbo and now we have a 300 horsepower Miata, and that's not going to happen. But we're, I'm just trying to think of like other normal sort of performancey cars, of which there are none these days. But I mean, mm. you know, would you rather have, for example, a Supra or even a GR86 if that could have a couple of pounds of boost from an electric turbo, not lose any of its responsiveness, but gain 100 horsepower um, and give you better fuel economy at the same time? Would it, would it be so bad? No, no, definitely yeah, not. I'm conflicted because I love the simplicity of an NA stick shift, but you know, like maybe the new Prelude when the Honda Prelude comes out, will have something of this. That's supposed to be a hybrid. I don't know. Interesting. Hmm. Um, well, Porsche is doing it right. Range Energy shocker. is doing it right in yeah. some other respects. Yeah. We are not going to talk about hybrids done wrong. We do that it's, of our own accord. I mean, everyone knows we've been to that. Listen, I, I, I will never shit on a Prius in terms of from technology. From a technical standpoint. From a technical standpoint, yes. right? I mean, the, the problem for all of us is that it's a CVT. 
that's the big problem is that no one no enthusiast likes a cvt mm-hmm. but you can't beat those things for or even on a cord hybrid have you seen the mpg numbers those things post they're just stupid camry hybrid a cord hybrid all of these you know these hybrids are 50 miles per gallon plus that's amazing that's really cool um and at a very small price penalty mm-hmm. right you can just upgrade to the hybrid for a thousand to three thousand bucks it's so it does make a lot of sense but um this is the first time where i'm really excited to drive something turbocharged like Mm. okay i think this turbo motor out of the 992 could possibly be better than um will certainly be better than the previous turbo and previous carreras that are turbocharged and possibly even better than the uh than the last and the greatest of the naturally aspirated carreras the non-gt cars then that's why I said nine nine yeah. one point. Yeah, you're one. not gonna be, you're not gonna beat a nine nine seven GT three for a nine nine one. No, not motor. from the motor. Yeah, no, no, that's that's not even close. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So as ever, it remains the case that nine nine seven GT three is the best Porsche ever made. <laughs> Unless you like, well, I'm fact checking. I would, I would air, I would air cool. I mean, for me, I like air cooled cars. Like my e golf is. Like your, they only last not, a lap on the track. Not at all like your e golf. <laughs> the opposite of your e golf. Another short lived air cooled Volkswagen. Um, yeah, unlike the first one, which was the opposite of short lived. They the only made twenty one million of them <laughs> <laughs> over like what one hundred and ninety three years. Yes. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff. I I like that the there's something interesting for enthusiasts that's not necessarily three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So the I next like question is uh, whether this can happen in manual transmission land. Should be interesting to see. Hey Honda, what are you t- are you referring to the? Prelude? Well, I mean that that I mean the CRZ like JCATs. That's a that's a stick shift hybrid. The the original Insight stick shift hybrid. Are those the only ones ever? Hold on, the only manual hybrids. There was a Civic hybrid. <laughs> <Manual>. um, yeah. <laughs> you, have you ever driven any of them? No. All right. So I hereby on air volunteer, <laughs> volunteer Jake CRZ for Derek to drive. Um, and we can do an episode on cool hybrid. Have you driven an Insight either? Mm-mm. Get the fuck out. Throw the keys, hit him as hard in the head as you possibly can. That's a big carabiner. Go easy. <laughs> Derek has the keys. And so I think it's time to end this episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Give me that. I'm leaving. <laughs> Okay, well, that was abrupt. (laughs) Door slam.